All right, I'm Cynthia. Um, those of you guys who didn't hear my introduction, um, I work at Mindvalley, I'm an online advertiser. Okay, thanks. Um, so I came to Mindvalley about six weeks ago, and before that, um, I grew up, I was born and raised in the US. So if anyone is uncertain, I'm also Chinese. <laughs> Two people said I was Pocahontas no. today. I'm not um, so I'm going to talk to you guys. You guys can sit back and relax. I'm going to talk to you guys about um, some lessons I've extracted from my travels. Um, so I've had the opportunity, the really lucky opportunity in my life, to be able to travel um, with my family and through school um, and also as a volunteer. So I'm going to take five places that I've either participated in a classroom as a student, as a teacher, or as a partner, an observer, and um, kind of tell you two things about each of the five places. So the first is um, just like a key takeaway or key um, success of the, either their educational policy or um, classroom methodology. Um, and then the second thing I want to tell you about is just something that wowed me or inspired me or I was surprised about. So the five places are going to be US, Morocco, um, India, Finland, and Brazil. So why do I want to talk about this? Um, so I'm pretty passionate about um, sharing stories and the fact that you can travel um, through other people's stories. And so I really um, like to do formal storytelling, even though like, when I um, informally share, I just feel like I'm bragging. But I do like to share about my travel experiences. And why that is is because I think that um, everyone can really learn from a conversation. And we have a lot to learn from each other and kind of learn a lot from each of them. Each person's best case practice. So, um, very American, this is Bart Simpson, and he's usually punished um, and has to write something over and over. So, I think we must learn from classrooms worldwide. Um, so, um, yeah, just a little background. I've had the lucky opportunity through an organization called ISEC and also just um, my personal travels to be able to go to a lot of countries and interact directly with the youth there. So, kind of have an idea um, or have had deep discussions about how their education is, um, how their historical criticism is when they learn their history, a lot of different things. Um, but again, I'm focusing on five countries and showcasing a couple afterwards. Oh, so this is my global classroom. Um, so the first USA, this is when I graduated university two years ago. Um, so some of the things that is really um, integrated into the American education system that really makes America, America at its core um, are things like diversity and competition, um, healthy sharing and respect for individualism. And I think that going through the whole education, education system in the US really made me who I am. And the last edu camp we went, we, um, that we held in May, we saw Waiting for Superman, which is a documentary I've seen like three times, and I almost want to cry at the very end each time, um, talks about how our system is broken how public school system is broken. However, I went to a good public school. Um, one of the things that um, the US um, values <laughs> is um, taxpayer money. And if, you're, if you pay taxes to your state and you live in a good place with high property taxes, you do get the opportunities that like, maybe a private school system would have. So I went to a good public school, went to a good public university. Um, and I even chose that over a good private university. Um, and with that, I actually grew up with people um, from all different cultures. Um, it's, the U.S. is a very big melting pot. People are of different religions and different social statuses. Um, rural, like people lived on farms, people lived in cities, people had tractors, people had like nice cars and stuff like that. So uh, I think the, one of the strengths of the U.S. system is that um, it embraces diversity um, in culture, in background, in thought, in interpretation. And I often grew up um, not scared to voice my opinion and my answer. I thought that I could share um, my opinion, and it was never like, punished. It was never um, disregarded or anything. And this is just more general. There are certain times where teachers aren't really open to um, like a classroom discussion or debate, but it really um, opened my eyes and I started traveling and realizing that this was not a value um, that was at the core curriculum of many different cultures. Um, so that's something that I think is really good about the US system in that um, there are always different answers, not always, sometimes there's different ways to get to the right answer or there's just multiple right answers. And I like that um, also kind of when you move forward through the edu education system in the US, 
Um, at university level, things are kind of on a macro level. Like, yes, you learn technical aspects, there's right answers, and you have to prove how you got the right answer. But um, when I've had experiences with my um, with fellow students going to different countries for kids' competitions, oftentimes like, the Chinese will drill down to the very minute detail and kind of miss the bigger picture, whereas the US <coughs> don't. Like some American volumes do the opposite. They'll get the, the main macro picture, but not exactly know the dates or the details or all the technical backgrounds right away. So that's cool. And well, this is just a picture. Um, I, something else in the US system is that from grade school through university, um, there's emphasis on group collaboration and group projects. And I studied marketing, business administration, and it was very theory based. But at the same time, we had a lot of um, like lecture discussions, but also group projects that made up a lot of our, our grade. Um, so Morocco, five years ago, I did my first international internship. I taught English in Morocco in a very um, underdeveloped neighborhood and in, in city um, called Sally. So this is kind of what the streets were like. My school was like right here, I think. Um, and some kind of history about um, Morocco, or just to give you picture or kind of picture of what Morocco is like. Um, the literacy rate is about 50% in the adults. So um, Morocco is implementing a lot of um, systems to kind of increase this 50%. Um, one of that is it's kind of incorporating the, the community. So in 100 mosques around Morocco, they have learning centers for adults to go to, try to learn to read and write, and, um, kind of learn kind of basic education. What we see is basic education now. Um, also, about 20 years ago, 60% of girls um, in, were enrolled in school at the age of seven. So 40% of them didn't even start education. Um, as well, 25% of the labor force was women um, in Morocco. So over, um, the time, over the years, there's been a more modern perspective of um, the role of women and men in the workplace. But that was the case 20 years ago. So um, a case study that I thought was really interesting, it was kind of hard to actually find a success story out of um, the Moroccan education system and the North Arab region. Um, one of the things is uh, a program called GEA, so it's a Girls Education Activity. It was funded by USAID, so the United States um, Agency for National Development. And that was at the core um, focus was to bring girls into schools and also retain them and have a complete education. So this was, I think, like a, it started in 2001. Um, and over the years, um, it's been a program that has seen results. And um, not, they, and what, from my, my research, they didn't hit like their long-term goals. Um, but they were able to increase the, the girls entering schools and keep them kind of retained longer, much longer than before. Um, what else about this program? Um, what was really good about the program actually was that they integrated the civil society as well. They integrated like NGOs, mosques, teaching um, centers to be able to not just tell girls like you should go to school, this will help you in the long term to be like, an educated mother and to be able to serve your community, et cetera, et cetera. But they actually um, formed a community that was really embracing of girls going to school, which I think is really important. And crucial. Mm -hmm. Was one of the difficulties in the retention rate for the girls? Was it was there an overriding feeling that what's the point of finishing this because I'm just going to become a housewife anyway? It was like the that was that was a biggest barrier, um, definitely because the perspective of women going to school to, at the times was like, yeah, exactly. What's the point? Like, girls should be staying at home, learning to cook couscous for the family, um, which takes hours and hours and hours and, and kind of stuff like that. But um, the changing perspective that when I was also teaching English um, to the kids in the on underprivileged areas was that um, even a lot of the boys, like my students who are boys would say, oh, but teacher, um, girls have, moms have a lot of power in the household. Yeah, they don't really kind of get out of the house as much, but they do have the, the final say in like financial decisions and raising the kids. Therefore, they're more powerful than the dads, which sometimes like people can argue, but I think the changing perspective now is that um, with media especially, um, and like, access to movies and everything, there's more opportunities for women. Um, so this is a huge eye-opener for me, because I grew up in the US, and it's like, what are men are equal? Um, everything like that. So um, that was interesting, and um, so thank you for the question. Um, 
so this is one of my classes. My classes when I got um, to Morocco at the beginning of the summer, um, five years ago, was um, like class that has like 30 people and they had very different ranging English levels. And then I started saying like, we need to break this down. Some people have like one month of English experience and people have two years. So I started breaking down my classes. This is one of my classes. Um, and everything here is like a made of space, a desk, so whiteboard and everything. And um, one of my last classes that I taught was my more advanced level, and um, I basically asked my students like, what kind of professions are out there? Profession means like occupation, what you can be as for a living. And um, I asked my students to raise their hand, and so they'd be like, oh, you could be a teacher, we could be a baker, we could be a bus driver. And I was like, okay, cool. What about if you're sick? Where do you go? Who do you go see? Um, who gives you medicine? They're like, oh, a doctor. And I was like, okay, what if you want to go? into space, like, what do you want to do, How, what's that called? And like, oh, I don't know what they said, something like space driver or something, and I was like, astronaut, <laughs> uh, and stuff like that, um, and they were like, after a while, they're like, teacher, teacher, we can't be any of these things. I was like, why not? Because also, being American, you, I figured you can be anything you want to be that you put your mind to, and they're like, it's not like that here, we can't do many things, we can't stay in school as long as we want, we can't be kids as long as we want, stuff like that. But at the same time, they had like this amazing spirit to them that they wanted to be here to learn English to improve the opportunity they had for themselves um, and for their families. So it was a really big eye-opener for me to learn that um, a country like Morocco and many other countries around the world don't have, um, like people are not born equal. People aren't born into society equal. You can't exactly change classes like you can in other countries that are more developed. Um, and this is also a country I learned that is very centered around, or a culture rather, it's really centered around um, the king and Allah and Islam. So there are some limitations to that too. A core, core class they take throughout their educational career um, is Islamic studies as well. So when you learn some things like science that like I say I learned in my school system, they might not have learned. And they also like geography, um, seen a little bit differently according to what Moroccans see as kind of like pride in their history or something like that. So that's my experience in Morocco. So the next is India. Um, this doesn't represent India. This represents um, some of um, what I've seen in India. Um, so the summer after Morocco, I did an international internship in India, <coughs> in Chandigarh, um, which is in the north of the state, the capital of Punjab. And I had um, basically um, a role as like a marketing assistant and um, corporate social responsibility coordinator at um, an NGO, a nonprofit around um, road safety. So it's one of the only ones in India. And so I was really, really passionate about being there to challenge people's perspective um, on road safety because in India, like over 100,000 people die in the roads each year, but it's almost something that is just taken as a general statistic like, oh, this girl died in the street today. Oh, shoot. Like, there's not really much like community gathering and mourning over that as we see in the U.S. versus in India. So I was really there to help challenge people's perspectives, um, or, or try to. Um, so, um, well, I guess it's more the next picture in sort of that. So I was here um, giving like a university workshop at Punjab University, and um, this is my boss who's in a wheelchair from a car accident, and that's me. We were trying to challenge people's perspectives on how to not drive illegally, how to drive safely, how to get legal licenses, actually take classes, not pay police officers for um, licenses. And this is, again, it isn't everyone, but it is a problem that is spread through India. Um, so one of the things was like, all right, let's become solution oriented. What kind of solutions do you have for people who are learning to drive, to be able to drive more safely and therefore help their families drive more safely and their friends? And one of the one of the kids was just like, oh, I think the best solution is to have a dirt road in the forest so we can get out all that anger. <laughs> get it out so it's not on the road and we don't endanger someone. And I was like, all right, <laughs> that is a solution. But I was really impressed with just that people were coming up with solutions, um, no matter how like not good a solution I thought it was from my background. Um, they were coming up with solutions. So one of the things um, that I've been really impressed about with India is that um, people, there is a culture um, of like community in the sense that people will help their juniors, people who are younger to them, um, do well in school or just there's a community there which 
I didn't see in the U.S. Like, I didn't really care about people who are under, who are younger than me in my school. Um, but also that through competition um, within schools, through like the race for like a high mark um, and grades and everything, people do kind of learn to think critically in India, which is a place um, I I was I've seen that more than what I've experienced in Chinese education. And Chinese education is more about giving the right answer first. Um, not really needing to explain why or how or whatever, but just kind of getting the right answer first. But in India, um, people are able to um, think, think critically, and just the fact that there's so much competition, there's a huge youth population, it's not really like, compared to China again, like, um, I'm gonna compete, I'm gonna compete for higher than you, you got a bad grade, ha ha ha, good for me, everything like that. I didn't really see that in India. And uh, what I've been the most impressed with as well is uh, my Indian friends. Um, some of them do like say the, they give up great jobs in other countries, like in London or the U.S. or whatever, because they want to get back to India. So with their background, um, like I have a friend who said that he wants basically to be a serial entrepreneur, create and turn out all these great um, companies that give back, but also make a profit and everything, and then turn it over so that that company can grow and they can employ more people, and because of that, more people can have a better opportunity within India. And that's kind of perspective I've seen, um, and just a TED talk that um, Tushar had shared before or recently was that um, someone says that someone was saying um, that with very educated students going into low-skilled labor, such as call centers, you'll get a lot of people um, who yes want to like stay at the company, want to get promotions, want to get a raise, um, but also besides just getting bored with their low-skilled work. They tend to improve the processes. They streamline um, different processes as well. Um, they find ways to do things better, kind of as for the whole picture. And that's something that I think this school is gives me a lot of hope in seeing um, India turning out all these like great students um, in terms of like how big their youth population is, not just people who are kind of learning that there's corruption and bureaucracy and, and going forward with that and taking bribes and everything with people that are really going out there trying to make a difference um, in, in their work. So the second place. So the third place I want to talk about is um, Finland. And I know we talked a little bit about the Nordic countries and Sweden, um, <laughs> Richard, uh, last time. And I think there's a lot of successes that um, Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Norway, um, Finland, uh, Denmark have in terms of the education, and I think a lot of that is instilled in um, their like socialist welfare <laughs> or social welfare kind of um, policies. Whether it's like high taxes, whether there's free healthcare, free education, but I think just the nature of um, having a very um, socially um, aware society really builds or really um, gives. Yeah, really is the reason why their education is so successful. Um, so for instance, in the schools, I think in Finland, there's like no private school. All, all public schools are performing at the level of like independent school in the US. Um, there's like free, you know, there's no tuition or something. There's like free meals, a um, few textbooks. Students don't really use textbooks. Um, they have more of a group mentality and like a project um, problem solving approach to different situations in their learning, which I think is really cool. And um, I remember just all many different articles I read over the years, just um, the success in a class is directly related to success in each individual student. Or, sorry, let me backtrack. The success in an individual student is related to the success of the class. So it's not like a lot of universities will have um, a curve where like 10% will fail, 10% will get the highest grade, and everyone's in between. But um, the school system in Finland, for instance, is that like if you um, you succeed because your class succeeds, and then you help people succeed because of that. Um, so I think that's something that's um, pretty awesome. And again, you can't um, like I mentioned last time, you can't exactly relate. You can't directly apply this system to say China, which is a very different um, society and culture in general. But there's like a key takeaway out of it, which is that you can help students do well by helping the whole class do well. So the, one of the ways I saw um, that was when I went to Finland, I was visiting a friend for five days, and we went up to Nokia, Finland, and we joined um, uh, a program from a certain organization called ISEC, 
And basically they had brought all these um, international interns in to teach in like the northern coldest regions of Norway where they hadn't seen foreigners. And they kind of just injected these um, international students to teach the high school students about um, like international relations, or global issues, um, different cultures and everything. And so this was kind of like the wrap up of that. <laughs> Um, and basically it was um, a closing ceremony and there's in ISIC culture in universities around the world there's dances that people are usually really reluctant to do at first because it's kind of embarrassing you get up and dance in front of everyone um, but when I was participating in the workshops all day um, and also <coughs> when we were doing the dance and we were like on stage and then all the students were in the crowd like everyone got up and did the dance like all these teenagers that are um, traditionally teenagers are very like self-conscious, they're very like into thinking what the next person thinks of them and their image and everything, but these, these kids just like got up, everyone did the dance, um, and when I was in the workshops, no one was like scared to kind of be the first person to say something or give their opinion, which I think is really cool when there is such a safe environment like that. So fourth, uh, wait, fifth place, Brazil. Um, so my third international internship was in Brazil, Rio de Janeiro, and um, they have a really amazing educational policy, and it's called the Bolsa Familia program, which is the family allowance program. So it's basically also social welfare, but what it also does, um, aside from keeping kids in school, is that um, it tries to uplift these families out of poverty as well. So the Bolsa Familia program is like a really renowned, successful program around the world, and it does have its criticisms, yes, um, like everything does. But um, what's really amazing is that um, I forgot the statistics, but basically uh, the kids that stay in school and get vaccinated and get medical checkups, they receive a stipend from the government, and it's not actually that much. It's, it's like 12 US dollars or something, um, which is like 35 grand. Um, but it actually helps the families a lot. It's like $12 per kid, and those that are absolutely poor, um, it's like 70 US dollars um, per kid. Or no, 70, okay, no, so 30, no, so that's like 100 ringgit for the absolute poor. And it actually really helps people, and what Bolsa Familia program does um, is short term, it lifts people out of poverty by giving cash transfers, um, but in the long term, it improves and increases the human capital to also long term lift people out of poverty. So um, one, of the, one of the things as well is that the rural areas is a lot more um, distribution of poor than in the, the urban areas, so about 40% of the people who participate in this program, um, or sorry, 40% of rural areas, 40% of the children in rural areas are part of the most familiar program, and 10% of the ur urban areas, no, I'm sorry, 17% of the urban areas kids are part of the program, and for instance, the two biggest cities, Sao Paulo and Rio, Rio de Janeiro, 10% of their kids are in these programs, but Rio and Sao Paulo, for instance, have some of the worst poverty situations and the most widespread among the whole um, country. So it's interesting in that like it's really kind of helping short term lift poverty, so we'll kind of see where this goes in the long term. Um, and there's been um, some, or I actually haven't run it yet, but I think this could be really replicated in other countries um, such as Africa where you can maybe give a conditional um, like cash transfer program as well for families if they are able to teach their kids um, about AIDS awareness and HIV spreading and everything. So I think like this program could really help to not only improve educational um, sh short um, falls with uh, more social problems as well. So uh, one of the things I learned, um, well when I went to Brazil I worked at an, um, another NGO that was consulting other NGOs directly related to providing quality education and arts in the favela slum areas. Um, so one of the programs was a literacy program. Basically there are some schools in the favela slums that don't have libraries. So we brought, um, brought books and we had like a goal for each of the students to read X number of books and if they did it, they all graduated together. So this was a graduation ceremony. Um, and these were two girls from the schools and they spoke absolutely no English and they didn't understand our Portuguese. Um, but anyways, I wear bracelets when I travel, and I collect them as I travel for meaningful experiences. And then this girl saw it on the right or on the left, and she had bracelets, and she was just like, "Oh, um, a equal mensch," so just we're we're like 
so uh, when I whenever I try to travel too, um, I try to just take the time to um, kind of experience like children because I don't look at anything like that. But um, I, I try to get in touch with children because um, they're almost like a rare commodity for me. Um, but I like to, yeah, try to go to schools and see if they can help teaching English or just if there's any way I can help. Um, so one of the places is Kofi Pi Thailand I went to a few years ago, um, traveling Southeast Asia with my friends. Um, they left to go back home and I stayed stuck around and then came to KL. Um, but in Kofi Pi, which is like a very like tourist resort island, I went to their school and helped teach English. They had like the longest names ever um, in Thai, but they were all very happy and they were really excited to actually see kind of a foreigner rather than just see like tourists everywhere. Um, what was really cool was that they were very shy in their own way, very playful, but like kind of shy when um, kids are nervous around strangers and stuff. So uh, that was a universal thing that I thought was beautiful. Um, Marble Island, Malaysia, this is in Sabah. I was here last year um, going diving with my family. And um, Marble Island is interesting because it's an island off of Sabah, the east coast. Um, but where we were staying, um, the owners of our longhouse, our guest house, um, they also started school on the island because they saw that there was um, a problem with kids um, being on the island and not refugees, but um, people who left the Philippines. So the Malaysians on the island, some Malaysians on the island that were very poor and also the Philippines that were there, they didn't have statehood anywhere. They couldn't technically go to school anywhere. So then um, the owners of our guest house basically just opened a school um, with getting donations and trying to promote the school and everything. But there are all these people here, um, all these kids who want to learn and are eager to learn Malay and English and math and everything that otherwise would not have had education. And it's really beautiful to see, like, kids just want to learn, they just want to play, they just want to have fun. Um, so they, those are these kids. It's called the School of Hope. Um, in Hong Kong, so my family is from Hong Kong. Um, and so this is like my mother culture, and I've been able to be fortunate enough to see um, my family in Hong Kong a lot in my life. And so yeah, this is my culture. Um, but <laughs> what I found was interesting is that um, Hong Kong, while it's a British school system, international school system, everything, they still kind of have the Chinese um, cultural traits, like um, kind of you know wanting to be right all the time um, and not really open to sharing. And, um, but again, this was, um, so this was a, a different group of people that weren't representative of all of Hong Kong. So I was in Hong Kong this past time, so this was just like two months ago, um, and through the organization ISIC, I chaired a conference, um, a national conference there, so there were over 100 people from Hong Kong universities. And as the chair, I found it very, very difficult to get people to share and get people to open up. So when I asked when I asked a question to their crowd and there was like a correct answer, they would all shoot up their hands, not all, some shoot up their hands to answer, but when I asked them to share something about what was the most inspirational part of the day or what something that was like an aha moment for you today, like no one would share. And um, being also American, like people share a lot and are open to sharing, want to share their story, obviously like me. Um, but it was very hard. So this is actually the last day where we did a group activity where they all sat on each other and they were also reluctant at first, but it was actually like an amazing opportunity for me because they actually did something out of their comfort zone. Um, and sat in each other. Um, so Cairns, Australia, this was right before I came to KL. Um, Cairns is at the Great Barrier Reef, so I went diving, but then I also, um, where I was staying, um, the neighbors had two girls <coughs> that were amazing, so I went to one of the girls' schools and um, with some of the people that were staying with me. And basically just shared our story to um, a classroom of kids. And just one of the things I thought was really funny was one of the um, guys came up to me and asked, how do you say hello in America? And I said, hello. <laughs> and he's like, oh. So um, it's just kind of cool to be able to share and break cultural barriers, whatever they may be, by um, communicating with the kids. And they're so curious and cute. Um, so from all this, um, Something that I've learned about myself is that I'm compassionate about trying to bring access um, of quality education to people um, and that one day hopefully they don't have to go trek somewhere really far um, to go to school. Um, but so one of the things is just uh, I've been doing a fundraiser. I ran a full marathon last year which is 42 kilometers or 26 miles 
and I'm raising money for 26 girls to stay in school through a really amazing program called Room to Read. Um, so what I found was interesting is it's pretty hard to get um, a lot of people in the U.S. to donate to causes like this because it's not something that directly touches them. Um, something like cancer, um, which is horrible, absolutely horrible, but um, a lot of people donate to that because Americans can really directly to cancer. Like some of their families had cancer, but unless they're from kind of a different country, un not so developed in Western, they're not really used to hearing about people not going to school. So that was one of the um, barriers I found. But all in all, um, it's been like nine months, I think, and I raised 5,000 US dollars. My goal is 6,500, so I'm still finding ways to raise money that doesn't exhaust my own network. Um, so that's interesting. These are just kind of pictures of what I'm seeing kids around the world, which is in the countries is that the program um, we're operating in, in terms of bringing girls to stay in school. Um, so the thing I wanted to leave with you is just kind of a quote. Um, I realize children do something invaluable we have forgotten. They can create joy out of what we see as almost nothing, and I feel compelled to take something out of my humbling experiences with them. The commonality among kids is visible in their eyes, the innocent nature of those running barefoot in villages situated along the train tracks, or those bathing the Nile is not one of defeat nor frustration. The spirit of these kids and their fortitude often falls shadow to the limitations we assign them. The true miracle, miracle lies behind, beyond their confines, that they will still find opportunities to laugh and play as children despite the extent of their circumstances. Um, so this is something that really fuels my interest in um, getting um, education more widespread and providing quality education. And I actually wrote this when I was 17 and applying to universities. Um, so, thank you, Mark Essay.